officially time to have that conversation on identity politics and why it is that identity politics is in fact failing the um, left side of the aisle. The community here is already suffering. The residents living in Nietzsche's Queen. They was first on line for the turkeys this morning. If they tell you to be there at 11 o'clock, you get there like 10.30, 10.45, but they already out there. The line is from over there yeah. to over here. Buy a house. The money. The fucking chaos in this country. The chaos around the world. If it comes down to pig dick Donald Trump and smoking Joe Biden, I'm sorry. I am sorry. Voting for pig dick Donald Trump is on the table. We're outside the Democratic Party headquarters because this party claims to be on the side of life and peace and equality. And we're saying that this is fucking crazy. And then, you know, you know, so, like, you know what? I told myself this week, like, yo, the internet. At around 2 p.m. on Wednesday, I released a video uh, talking about Biden and asking the question if he was actually losing uh, the more extreme elements of his coalition, that right there being his uh, voter base. And, of course, I talked about a few incidents. Of course, one of those was an incident that you're about to see here momentarily about the immigration crisis, of course, which I've covered on several occasions. I've done a lot of videos on this. Also, I talked about Michael Rappaport's little blow up, little freak out. And of course, I also talked a little about Cardi B's little freak out. Now guys, I'm gonna be visiting all three of these one more time. But of course, in the previous video, it was done to explain exactly why it was that Biden was losing these people. I'm using this now to kind of explain to you why it is that identity politics never works. And of course, you're seeing it actually work out right now in your very own streets. But let me play something uh, to kind of preamble this. Now, Jordan Peterson was on Bill Maher the other night. And uh, Jordan Peterson can sometimes be a little bit cringe, but for the most part, he's actually pretty good on some things. It's just the guy's, quite frankly, still a little bit cringe. Maybe you might expect a little bit more of a dynamic uh, sense out of him, a dynamic approach, but still at the same time, it's just kind of who he is, a clinical psychiatrist, so you really and truly can't expect this guy to do anything uh, outside of being himself. But he kind of called this, and of course, he was talking about young voters, as I will show you guys here soon. I might as well go ahead and throw them into the identity politics area because they are a group that is, in fact, pandered to just about every four years. And I mean pander to, I mean pander to at the worst possible rate you could actually pander to somebody because they are so young and impressionable and idealistic. But we'll get to that here soon. Let me play this for you guys. So that way you guys can get a bit of a, uh, a bit of an understanding where we're going at with this video. And of course, it comes from HBO. So therefore, there's going to be little headers on it from time to time. So uh, if you feel the need to listen to it rather than actually watching it, I understand happens is that you, they are then saying that well, being oppressed is being I don't know if the good. Holocaust yeah. is... Well, this, but this is the, re this is the is main issue. I mean, part of the reason that you see all this foolishness on university campuses, too, is because people have bought this idiot metamarxism, which is that the way to look at every social relationship that people ever have is through the lens of power. And that that is, we can put that squarely at the feet of the universities, as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, marriage is a patriarchal institution, and business is nothing but oppression, and you have to view every single situation that emerged historically as oppressor versus oppressed. And then once you get that, which you can get in about two minutes, if you sit in a course that teaches that sort of thing, you have a lens to moralize about the whole world through. And then you see the situation is that the leftists have already decided the Palestinians are the victims. And as you pointed out, if you're a victim, then you're morally righteous. And even more conveniently, if you stand for the victim, then you're morally righteous, regardless of what you do with your own life. And that's pretty much what university students are taught from the time they enter the university classroom. And that's how they, you know, orient themselves morally. Well, and I that's think. at the hands of the radical left, too, Bill. And one of the things the Democrats also have to pay the price for, I would say, is their absolute refusal to draw a line between the moderate Democrats and the extremists. They're completely incapable of doing that. Like, I've talked to 40 senators and congressmen in the last five years. I asked them all the same question, including RFK. He wouldn't answer either. When does the left go too far? Well, we certainly bloody well saw it in the last month, didn't we? Because they got the oppressor, oppressive narrative, a uh, little mucked up, we might say. And we're going to, the consequences of that are going to unfold pretty brutally over the next few months. Oh, I also forgot to mention we do this for uh, copyright purposes, leaving the header like little tiny little squares over certain pieces of the video and letting like eight sex be visible. But uh, we'll talk about that at another time, especially when we do a video on copyright itself. But still, 
we got to get into this. So where exactly did identity politics come from and why is it prevalent today and why is it being used? And of course, why is it the, uh, how do I say the golden dream of the left to actually pull this off? Well, back in the 1960s and 70s, there was this guy by the name of Fred Hampton who tried to, uh, let's just say, uh, bring certain minority groups together. His hope was to bring Asians, blacks, Hispanics all together, even with white liberals. Of course, they were warned by white, they were warned by Malcolm X about white liberals, but that's a completely different discussion altogether. They, were, they wanted to bring these people together. This also included gays and other disaffected groups to create basically one great big giant party. This entire idea would eventually be pushed by Jesse Jackson. Of course, it would be pushed throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s. And of course, it was Barack Hussein Obama was probably the first out of that group to become president. Of course, I think he's probably the only one of that group to actually hold a presidential office. But of course, I appreciate you guys kind of know where I'm going with this. So basically what they've done, their entire existence is play the role of identity politics, basically play the race role. And of course, since then, they've decided to incorporate other groups. I've talked about this in several videos before that even the LGBT, TQ community kind of fits this little mold. For example, the L stands for lesbian, gay, of course, is the G, B is bisexual, and T is the transness, which, of course, I've got to say in a very, very uh, weird way because of the algorithm. If you guys recall correctly, back in 2019, there was a Democratic Party debate. It was during their 2020 nomination process, and I want to say it was Julian Castro stepped up and was asked about the possibility of abortions for transness abortions for transes. Basically, the whole point was they wanted to pander to these people who were creating multiple genders and all that type of stuff there, which makes me think that there are a lot more groups, of course, in, under this rainbow coalition that they've kind of created. But of course, as you guys are seeing, they're beginning to piss these people off, as you guys will see with Biden's polling numbers. Now, I know that these polling numbers that are coming out, and I know this little bit that I'm about to show you from NBC is going to make you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, this right here is younger voters. Well, it's not just younger voters. The Biden administration is losing all the way around. And something else, too, is that a lot of these voters who fit the identity politics mold or those that you would choose to go for when it comes to identity politics, they would actually fit this age bracket. But this right is only one part of a bigger piece of this entire video. Let's go ahead and roll this. So Biden has suffered erosion just since our last poll within his own party. And you look for what might be driving some of that erosion. It's this topic where it stands out the most. We ask about a series of issues. Biden continues to perform poorly on the economy. But when you ask about foreign policy, look where it is right now. Biden, 33 approved, 62 disapproved. Again, our last poll in September, just before the situation in Israel emerged, he was 41-53. So he's eight points down on approval, and he's almost 10 points up on disapproval. And here is where you see on this topic a huge generational gap. And I think this gets into, obviously, the presidential race, American politics in general. Just check this out. We asked about Biden's handling specifically of the Israel-Hamas war. It's similar overall here to his foreign policy job performance. But now look at the breakdown by age. Among the oldest group of voters, 65 plus, Biden's actually plus 12, majority approval. The youngest group of voters, 18 to 34, Biden is just 20 percent approved, 70 percent disapproved. He is 50 points underwater. That is a net gap of 62 points between the youngest group of voters and the oldest group of voters on how they assess Biden's performance when it comes to this war. Uh, he couldn't be Now, I want to kind of switch things up a little bit and kind of switch the video around. Now, normally when you see this, you would automatically think that I would talk about college voters. I'm going to talk about college voters a lot more this weekend, asking the question if Gen Z is actually lazy. But here's the thing, though. Instead of talking about college voters first, and we'll talk about college voters second, the third group I'm going to talk about, of course, is going to be, um, let's just say, it's going to be uh, the person that is the, how do I say this, uh, the uninformed voter, which I'm going to be using Cardi B as an example, and then I'm going to be talking about white liberals last. But who do I want to talk about first? I want to talk about blacks and Hispanics because this right here right now is completely linked. With that right there being said, let me play this 30-second clip for you guys that occurred this past weekend in New York City. As most of you guys know, there is a migration crisis going on in the United States of America. And, of course, we've covered this in several videos. We've seen that Venezuelans are getting roughly $7,000 a month. And, of course, there are a lot of people who live in these neighborhoods in these big cities that are of color who are a little bit upset about the fact that they're being forced to share uh, their living spaces with people who, quite frankly, they don't think they don't think should be here. People who, quite frankly, don't deserve the benefits that these people are about to get. So with that there being said, let's roll this and come back on the other side. The community here is already suffering. 
The residents living in NYCHA's Queensbridge houses look forward to the mobile food pantries that show up weekly. But over the past year, they have witnessed 8,000 migrants move into their neighborhood, and they have also noticed the migrants are also starting to take their stuff. They was first on line for the turkeys this morning. If they tell you to be there at 11 o'clock, you get there like 10.30, 10.45, but they already out there. The line is from over there. To Food's over running out. You had the budget cuts. Don't worry. We'll bring that back up with Cardi B because, of course, she falls under the, uh, let's just say she falls under the umbrella of uninformed voters. So, the whole point of identity politics, Rainbow Coalition, is to bring all these people together. However, what they don't seem to understand is that these people are all single-issue voters. Let me give you an example of what I mean. The current black voter, not black male, I mean, I mean mostly black liberal and black female, of course, that are being the black male uh, liberal, he traditionally votes Democrat primarily. A lot of black men are starting to wake up and they're starting to realize that maybe Republicans, conservatives might be the way to go. Truth be told about black voters is they're a little bit more socially conservative. However, they always tend to be a little bit more on the poor side. They typically tell them to come from very, very poor communities. There are a lot of cases where they do, in fact, get arrested where and they get locked up. And, of course, some cases may be a little bit extreme. But, of course, most cases it comes to find out that they did, in fact, deserve the sentence. And they did, in fact, deserve to be arrested at that time. Blame the system. That's the way it always works. But... The thing about the current coalition that the Democratic Party has built that the Biden administration is trying to work on is they're focusing primarily on black women. We talked about this in the previous video. I'll link it in the description box. That what they've tried to do is they've tried to uh, open up, they call abortion health care is what they're doing. They want to expand that, seeing how it is that black women abort their kids at a much, much higher rate than any other race. To go on top of this, they also talk more about voting rights and overall government handouts, more government access to just about anything and everything you can get a hold of, whether it be WIC or welfare or unemployment, which, of course, unemployment is something I think a lot of people have actually been on. So I don't really call that right there an actual handout or anything like that, because I'm pretty sure most people watching this have had to go and collect some form of unemployment, especially if you've been laid off from a job. So we shouldn't even include this in there. I also don't want to include anything like Social Security or veterans benefits, because Social Security typically comes to retirees who are over a certain age. And of course, veteran benefits are for those who actually serve this nation, got injured while serving the nation and deserve some form of compensation. It is theirs to have. But basically, most entitlements like welfare and WIC and, of course, food stamps, stuff like that. More access to this. And, of course, there are a lot of white people on these things, too. Don't worry. We'll talk about white liberals here in a second. We'll talk about those who actually collect these types of entitlements. We'll talk about that here in a second, too. The thing is this right here. This right here is the pandering aspect. And also not to mention the fact that white man, bad, white person, bad. That's actually what it is. They've also chose to use this exact same line of thinking on white single women. All you gotta do is go back to the ad that Barack Obama launched in his 2012 re-election effort, the ad of Julie, where it was that Julie basically would be on a government handout or government assistance for the rest of her life if she needed anything. Of course, they tried to disguise it or the guise of health care, but if you actually looked into it, you saw more and more and more benefits. The idea was to make that person dependent. This way, people don't have to go out and work as hard. Of course, these people, for the most part, aren't really contributing to society, but this is how they actually get them. Not saying all, but this is their shtick. This is what they want to do. They want to ensure that this type of person does not, in fact, uh, have to go without. So basically hand them government handouts, but instead what you're doing is actually paying them to stay home, and you're not even really truly giving them a living wage. That's basically what the hell it is. That's the shtick. The thing about identity politics, though, is that every single one of these voters, of course, or every single one of these groups, they're all single-issue voters, which is where I'm going to be entering the territory of Hispanics. A lot of Hispanic voters, for the most part, and black voters really truly really aren't that different. They typically tend to be socially conservative, but fiscally a little bit more liberal. The topic of immigration is brought up a lot. And I'll have a video on immigration and the perspectives that are given in a video here in the near future. But the thing about Hispanics is that they've tried to go with the whole free health care for those who come over, for those who are still legal, amnesty, stuff like that. That's practically the shtick. And of course, the benefits of giving somebody, say, work permits if you arrived here before July 21st, which of course is what has got the blacks in Chicago and New York and a lot of other very, very liberal cities uh, have got them so hot and bothered. Of course, they should be because their government basically chose people who aren't even citizens, weren't even born here. Where is the per person who is a uh, black, more than likely was in fact born here and is an actual naturalized citizen of this country. They see these people coming over and taking away benefits. Now, why is there a problem? Well, as I've explained in several videos, especially on the topic of immigration in these very, very blue cities, eventually crime is going to occur. A lot of these people who are being imported in are military age males over the age of 18. And as a result of this, when people begin to start not getting, begin to start losing money, when the opportunities begin to dry up, 
And of course, now you've got this issue where they're cutting sanitation in the city of New York. Yes, this is probably going to create a lot of crime. Blacks and Hispanics typically don't tend to get along, which is also the same of Asians, too. However, Asians is a special category. They typically tend to be much, much better educated. And of course, there was that whole stop Asian hate thing where everybody wanted to blame white people for all the Asian hate. But in reality, the people who were committing all the violence were black. Very, very weird, but we'll probably touch that at a later date. Fact of the matter is, is that with Hispanics, they typically try to use the topic of citizenship. Basically coming over here, getting your green card, becoming an actual citizen. Whereas with black voters, they love to use entitlements and voting rights, which is very, very weird because they'll say we need to secure voting rights and we need more voting rights, but yet they have to vote to actually get them, which also tells me that maybe they already have voting rights. Let's go ahead and move on to young people. Last weekend, uh, as you guys may know, a bunch of uh, very, very young protesters, the pro-Palestine protesters, and of course, Biden is losing a lot of favor with the young people right now because he is siding with Israel and they are siding with Pal the Palestinians in this entire Israel-Gaza war. They show up to protest in Washington, D.C., and of course, they went after the Democratic Party headquarters. By the way, these right here were liberal voters, self-professed liberal voters. I'll give you an example of one of them. They are demanding a ceasefire to what's going on in the Middle East. They are demanding that the Biden administration step in. And of course, Biden's probably not going to do that because Biden, for the most part, is pretty much a weakling. I would argue that he's actually the weakest president that America has ever had. I don't really have to argue it. It's, it, it's pretty obvious. Here's what's really weird, though. Biden has agreed to be uh, to give the eulogy at Jimmy Carter's funeral. Jimmy Carter is oftentimes perceived to be one of the three weakest presidents in American history, if not the weakest. I personally think that it was uh, James Buchanan, and I think that Jimmy Carter is right there in that category with uh, James Buchanan and Franklin Pierce. You have to go back a lot, way, way, way back in time, and actually you got to do some real research to see exactly how weak the other two presidents were. I think that Biden is uh, a lot weaker than all three of those, probably put together. But then again, that we've got at least one more year of his administration, and we have uh, one more year of what could be chaos to come, so we really truly don't know. Fact of the matter is, is that these left-wing radicals, especially these Gen Z college students, they voted for Biden, and they voted for Biden in droves. People have argued that the real reason why they did that was because they viewed Biden as weak already, and they thought it would be easier to overthrow him. However, you're starting to see that a lot of these young people are saying to themselves, look, we can't control this. We can't control what the hell is going on. And quite frankly, you can't. Other things to consider is that Biden has been the exact opposite of what they voted for. They think the situation in the Middle East could result in uh, them uh, being given draft cards, when, of course, that more than likely will not occur. Most of these kids have got to sign up for selective service. And they don't seem to understand that just because you sign up for selective service does not mean that you're going to be drafted and pulled into the military. It doesn't appeal to these type of people. It doesn't appeal to these type of leftists. And, of course, to go on top of that, all these genders have been created, and now you have to find a new way to pander to every single uh, gender that you've created. Somewhere right around 1,000, so obviously pandering is going to be a lot harder. Fact of the matter is that Biden has lost these people, and there was even a survey done a while back showing an actual study showing that Gen Z males in particular were actually starting to swing more conservative. I think wokeness has kind of done this, especially given our culture of gamers and all the uh, films, all the SJW crap that we've had to deal with in films. I think that's also had something to do with it as well. But still, at the same time, ways to pander to the young people is college debt being removed, being relieved. Of course, you know, if you do this right, you're going to alienate the working class because they got to pay the debt. And then to go on top of that, you try to promise them a better future, but when you've got rampant inflation, you don't see a better future. You're only looking two or three years in front of you, so therefore you feel like you've been hoodwinked, even though you're very idealistic. Not to mention a lot of these kids, of course, are more on the socialistic side, and they're not exactly getting the brand of socialism that they want. So once again, the use of identity politics here has in fact failed. Now let's go to the uninformed voter. This is fucking crazy. And then, you know, you know, so, like, you know what? I told myself this week, like, yo, the internet right now is too dark because celebrity drama, of course, we, we, we love it. We, inf we infuse with it. We watch it. But it's like, yo, that's little of what's really going on in the world right now. That's nothing compared to what's going on in the world right now. The world is in fucking shambles. After the... After, um, There's not really a whole lot to say about Cardi B, but here's what I will say about Cardi B. 
Cardi B, like uh, Dwayne Rock Johnson, endorsed Joe Biden. Okay, and that right there was to be expected. Biden went on Rogan, I mean, excuse me, The Rock went on Rogan the other day and said he had friends that were loyal to both Republicans. You know, he said he had friends that were loyal to the Democratic Party. I would play the clip, but of course, if I played the clip, it would be too long. Cardi B is the type of person who's got a very, very large following, okay? Um, and while she sounds unintelligible, she did get attacked by her base. I'll try to leave the full five-minute initial clip that she put in there in the description box for you guys to listen to if you want to. By the way, I can't help but look at that video and think that maybe she had a lot of filters on and that entire thing looks fake, but I mean, it is what it is. She got attacked by her own, but of course, the more radical side saying, what are you doing? Why are you attacking Biden? Why are you saying you'll never know? And like I said, this is only 29 seconds, okay? There was a lot in there, okay? I'll put the full thing in there. And she surprisingly responded back, believe it or not, with something that wasn't fully intelligible, but it wasn't wrong. Basically, what they did was they responded to her by saying that Congress controls the purse, all that type of stuff there, which, of course, they're correct. But she politely puts them back in their place and says what a lot of people already know, that it's actually the president of the United States that signs off on the budget officially and also sets the agenda. So score one for Cardi. You see, the uninformed voter at some point in time does, in fact, become informed. So what do you do? You pay them to go endorse you. You talk about the issues like race or whatnot. You pump up the whole racial narrative, which, by the way, is mostly media-driven, and who the hell trusts that? That's actually what they do in this case. And the uninformed voter goes out there and tells the masses that, hey, look, uh, we're going to vote for this person here, or I endorse this person here because of such and such. Of course, no real reason given, and people blindly follow. I mean, we do have a lot of NPCs out there. I can think of a lot that I know personally uh, who still just spew up everything that the media says. So I got to give kudos for to Cardi for jumping back against her crowd. More than likely, if she does vote, she'll probably still vote for Joe Biden. And that brings me to the white liberal. And what I mean by the white liberal is not the white leftist. You're probably thinking, you really go after the left. Why well, don't you go ahead and make a distinction right now? There's classical liberals, there's city liberals, and then there is the city classical leftist, which is typically the more fascistic uh, Marxist type. Michael Rappaport does not strike me as this, but he damn sure is annoying. And of course, he's gone viral for a minute and a half long spiel about uh, Donald Trump and smoking Joe Biden. The guy's a freaking, uh, I'm not even going to go that. But here's about 20 seconds of it, and I'll explain his deal on the other side. A car. Buy a house. The money. The fucking chaos in this country. The chaos around the world. If it comes down to pig dick Donald Trump and smoking Joe Biden, I'm sorry. I am sorry. Voting for pig dick Donald Trump is on the table. I'm s I do not believe that Michael Rappaport will vote for Trump, but then again, though, he was also speaking at a pro-Israeli rally. He was upset about the situation between Israel and Gaza. And between Israel and Gaza. He's very, very pro-Israel, apparently. But he's also on the classical liberal side. He's the typical New York lip. Now, I'm not trying to say this to insult New York liberals or anything. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of New Yorkers who do not like Michael Rappaport and probably think he is just as aggravating as anybody else out there. But here's the thing that I need to go ahead and say. Do you guys remember all those riots we had in history? They were all in blue cities. I'm showing you guys some photos now of the Boston busing riots. Yeah. It's mostly the white people who live in those areas who were upset with the fact that blacks were being bused through their neighborhoods. The fact of the matter is the white liberal is actually the most racist person of them all. They want to use the black to get their own means in. And their means, of course, is separation, community, organization. Michael Rappaport's entire minute and 20 some odd second spiel about or his entire complaints that he had towards the current situation was he was pissed off the fact that a lot of pro-Palestinian uh, protesters were going up and down New York, tearing down American flags, tearing down Israeli flags. But he was also pointing his guns at the fact that the vast majority of these people who were protesting were minorities. They were black, some of them were white, a lot of them were Arab. I mean, that's really and truly what he's going for. Now, he'll tell you he's pro-black. I mean, he is married to a black lady. I'll give him that. But the mindset of someone like, say, Michael Rappaport is a little bit different. Now, I just try to distinguish that just now because, obviously, I know somebody in the comment section is going to say, well, he's married to a black woman. Same thing with Bill Burr. But Bill Burr is typically not very, very political. He really isn't. I mean, his wife was giving Trump the finger the other night at the UFC event where everybody was had already been cheering for Trump. The minute he walked in with Tucker Carlson and Don Jr. and all of them, Joe Rogan talked about this. But the thing about Michael Rappaport or the mindset of someone like Michael Rappaport is keep them out of our neighborhood. 
Where do you think him and his wife of color, where do you think they live at? They live in suburban areas. Even black people do this. LeBron James, of course, he lives in a suburban area in California, Brentwood. I mean, they don't want to live in the neighborhoods that they came from. They don't want to live with the actual peeps themselves because they know the living conditions. You see, the classical liberal or the city liberal believes that uh, these people don't need to assimilate with those of their actual color or those of their neighborhood. They want the communities organized. That's what we call non-assimilation. It's on several occasions. They don't want these people to assimilate with them. So anytime you hear these people virtue signal, what you're trying to do, what they're doing in reality when they say stuff like Black Lives Matter and stuff is, oh, I'm all for you. I'm okay with this. I I'm good with this just as long as they stay over there. Biden administration, the Obama administration is going to give them whatever the hell they want. But they ain't going to touch us because we vote for these politicians on the state and local level. It's called being organized. That's actually what the hell is going on here. Someone with the mindset of uh, Michael Rappaport wants blacks, Hispanics, and Asians kept out of his neighborhood because he probably views them as scourge. He doesn't care what they do, just keep them the hell away from me. That's the real truth about the white liberal, or at least the white city and suburbanite liberal. So when they virtue signal, like I said before, and they scream Black Lives Matter to be on the black person's side, in reality, what they're really saying is, I'm on your side as long as you're over there and do not assimilate with me. I'm voting for the Democrat nominee. I'm voting Democrat in the cycle because... Yeah, he's going to keep you away from me. That's what's really going on here. And this right here is why identity politics has failed. There was a video made by a YouTube content creator a few years ago named Stephen Michael Davis. I'm not really that much of a fan of him personally. Don't really want to bring him up in videos or whatnot. But he made a video about Kyle Kalinske saying that the left could create a uh, Tea Party movement within their own. Basically, a bunch of progressives uh, basically getting the squad to be like, like more than half of the Democratic Party, two-thirds, something like that. But when you actually look at the congressional districts and you look at how blue they are, the type of Democrat that they vote for, or even in red districts, the type of Republican that they vote for. Like, for example, you've got a guy who's a prior service Marine like myself, but he's a socialist running for the uh, – he's running for the Senate seat against uh, Jim Justice in the state of West Virginia. That's an extremely red state. This guy's got no chance of winning, but they want to create an actual coalition of, of a radical leftists. Basically making the squad, like I said before, two-thirds of the Democratic Party. However, the demographics works against them and the neighborhoods themselves. They don't want radical lefty loons, even though the vast majority of Democrats that are in Congress and the Senate now are compromised and batshit crazy. Trevor Loudon has done a lot of videos on how many of these people are actually avowed communists and how many of them have actually been working with the Communist Party USA on the down low. Fact of the matter is it's not realistic, okay? It's just not realistic for these people to create their own little tea party or a massive movement. And one of the biggest reasons why they do that is because they rely heavily on identity politics. Now, there's a book about this called Asymmetrical Politics that talks much, much more in detail about this. But let me just kind of sum it up for you right now. When Republican candidates run for president, they run more based on ideology. Typically, the standard bearer of the party, at least since the 1980s, has been Ronald Reagan. Another video that we will do in the future. Reagan has always been the standard bearer that they've gone to. They had George W. Bush, and they had the compassionate conservatism thing in 2000 through 2008. Didn't work out. You had the old, uh, you had the old soldier warmonger John McCain, which I'm not really that big of a fan of. When you actually dig into his actual information and background, then of course in 2012 you had the faux conservative in Mitt Romney, and then you had the paleocon who was a former New York business dem and Donald Trump in 2016, which is kind of the model of the party now. The party's kind of looking which way to go. That's another video for another day. But typically when Republican presidents today, we run for president, they run more based on ideology. Who's more ideologically pure, especially when it comes to overall conservatives, which we'll talk about identity politics on the right in the uh, next video that comes out on Friday. But what's the deal with the Okay, left? so here's the real deal. I talked about black, Hispanics, white libs, and I talked about young people. However, going back to the LGBTQ, you notice that there's four letters there. So that's four separate groups that want something else. They are all single-issue voters. The people that Democrats are paying to, and I'm not saying that all Hispanics are single-issue voters. When I said that earlier, I'm saying that they try to gauge them in with immigration, so they automatically assume that they're all single-issue voters. Same thing with black voters. Same thing with young people. Same thing with every single minority group. They basically try to run with that, and then they try to run on the racism shtick. Everything that the right represents is racist, so they try to prey on these people's emotions. However, what they don't seem to realize is that every single one of these groups are natural enemies, and now you are seeing the entire stage being set 
for a whole bunch of chaos. Go back to Dave Chappelle and his comedy specials talking about you got a gay man in here, you got a trans person here. Talk about the vehicle where you get. These people don't get along. They're all natural enemies. They claim they may all want the same thing, but in reality, they all want something different and they all have some form of envy of the other. Go back to the uh, immigration crisis. You got black voters who feel like they're being shunned by the Democrat politicians. Done several videos on this of them saying that they will not be voting Democrat. They will be staying home. That right there remains to be seen. But in some of these areas, if you had the slightest bit of black voters stay home and another slight bit of black voters vote for RFK, some vote for Trump, some vote for friggin' Cornell West. This very could be completely disastrous for the Democratic Party, which has decided to hedge all their bets on minority and disaffected groups, which, of course, all together only makes up about maybe 25% of the overall country, which is only about 31% of the voter base. And even though they do have a lot of white libs at the end of the day, they're in there, everything in their party kind of stops and keeps them at about 41 or 42% of the overall vote. They have to get more overall independence to win, which they normally do in the elections that they do win than a Republican does, where the Republican base itself is actually getting a little bit larger. It's already about 44 to 47% of the election. I understand that polling typically tends to swing to the Democrat. Well, a lot of that is because you have more left-leaning moderates. That's a different conversation altogether. If we want to talk about it in the comment section, we can debate that. We can discuss that there. But the fact of the matter is that the Democrat coalition itself relies on identity politics. And they are all, each group, single-issue voters for the most part. And they try to pander based upon that and they prey upon the emotions. However, when you have a leadership that's currently in office, it goes back to what Jordan Peterson said. It's about to explode. As I've said on several occasions, you're bringing in a lot of Venezuelans, you're bringing in a lot of Arab voters, people that we don't know that are going to these very, very large cities. Arab voters, for example, I didn't mention this earlier, but I was going to mention this more in the identity politics on the right. They don't get along with gays. That's not something they stand for, especially Sunni, uh, Sunni Muslims. They do not stand for that. Yeah, we have to tell Libs, we have to tell uh, the LGBTQ community all the time. Go over to the Middle East and come back and tell us how the hell it went for you. You are not liked over there. You're tossed off buildings. But, of course, they want to spread that message across the rest of the world and think that everybody will accept it. And, of course, it's not going to work. Fact of the matter is, is that identity politics is what they have been using. And it's actually what they've been using to base every one of their policies off of. And, of course, it's actually blow up in their face. It has failed. And I think more chaos is yet to come. But we have one more year to go uh, in this entire process. And I'm pretty sure that's going to come up again. So trust me, there's going to be another video that's going to be more in video essay format with overall history. That's going to be a lot larger, much, much longer and a lot more detailed, including even incidents. I plan on making a lot more of those in the coming year. With that right there being said, guys, make sure you guys hit the like button, subscribe, share the video, sign up in the comment section. I would love to hear you guys' thoughts, and I'll see you guys later.